Welcome everyone and thank you for joining us for today's NAC at Home program. My name is Nadine Heidinger and I'm the Director of Communications at the National Arts Club. For those of you who are not familiar with the National Arts Club, we are a 501c3 nonprofit based in New York City with a mission to stimulate, foster, and promote public interest in the arts. Annually, we host over 150 free programs, including exhibitions, theatrical and musical performances, lectures, and readings. To find out more about the National Arts Club, you can visit us at nationalartsclub.org or you can find us on all the social media channels, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube. On behalf of our literary committee, it is my pleasure to welcome you to today's event featuring George Saunders, the Booker Prize winning author of Lincoln in the Bardo and 10th of December, who will be discussing his latest work, A Swim in a Pond in the Rain which the New York Times called a literary masterclass on what makes great stories work and what they can tell us about ourselves and our world today. George also teaches in the Creative Writing Program at Syracuse University. He will be in conversation with Keith Gesson, the author of the novels, All the Sad Young Literary Men in a Terrible Country. A contributor to the New Yorker and the London Review of Books, Keith teaches journalism at Columbia University. A swim in a pond in the rain can be purchased at a discount from our independent bookseller Books on Call, and we'll be sharing the link in the chat during the conversation. Following the conversation will be a brief Q&A, so please feel free to use the Q&A function for any questions you might have. And without further ado, let me please turn it over to George Saunders and Keith Gesson. Please enjoy the conversation. Hi, thank you for that introduction. Thank you for having us, everyone. Thank you for coming. Um, George, how is your internet? It's pretty weird. Uh, I'm up here in Oneonta and uh, on satellite internet in my, my dungeon like basement. So the, um, the video tends to be a little funny and the audio tends to be pretty good. So I'm gonna try to sound really smart to make up for how I look, which is, sort of the story of my life anyway. So, so, so it's my fault and bear, bear with me if it gets funky, everybody. Um, great. Um, so George, it's such, it's such a, um, for me, such an honor and kind of a delight to, to talk to you. Um, you were my teacher at Syracuse uh, where I did my uh, MFA in fiction. Um, I started 20 years ago this fall um, in 2001. And, um, and I want to ask you about that. So, and, and I just want to preface my question by saying, you know, when, uh, when we got there uh, for grad school, a lot of us um, were coming from, you know, situations either because we had uh, jobs or, or whatever, where we, we didn't have a lot of time to write. And, and suddenly um, we had all this time to write. Mm -hmm. And it turned into kind of a, it turned into a sort of a contest to see who could clear the most time to write and, and could, could you know, eliminate the, the most things from their lives like uh, eating <laughs> or, or showering, um, you know? And so, so it was, there was this kind of culture of, of, you know, not just only writing, not, and, and, you know, often in a kind of selfish way. And, um, and the faculty, not in a bad way, but the faculty were kind of part of that culture where you kind of really felt like the faculty, they had their important work to write and, and, you know, they were teaching because they had to, um, and you kind of didn't want to take up too much of their time. Um, and then, um, so my first year there, I, I didn't have a class with you. Um, and that was kind of the vibe. And then my second year, I, I had your, your workshop and um, it was, it was the opposite of that. Uh, it felt like you were putting in a ton of time. It was kind of weird. <laughs> um, and, 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 but it, you know, it felt like you were, um, it felt like you had decided that instead of kind of doing it um, as a, a thing that you had to do, um, you were going to do it, you know, as, as well as you could, and that that would actually um, benefit you like that, that would somehow feed your art. I, I don't know. I, I, but I've always wanted to ask you like, was that a conscious decision that you made or, or is that just how you are? Or why, why were you that kind of teacher? You, you, what you said is exactly right, Keith. Um, uh, 
and this conversation is an honor for me too. Nice to be with you. Um, I, I think I figured out early on that it was going to be a lot easier to believe in it and to commit to it than for me, than it was going to be to sort of phone it in, you know, cause I, I had to really work to be a good teacher. So I, I think it was just kind of a decision to, to have a life that was somewhat, um, honest, you know, or, or kind of holistic, uh, and I, I felt pretty early on that if I if I took the students really seriously, it left me plenty of time, and it also left me a peace of mind that I wouldn't have if I was kind of trying to, um, you know, get just get back in the '80s. I think that was the idea was that you know the the kind of decadent, out of control writer took the stupid workshop job and phoned it in while smoking, you know, and and uh, and then when I started it, it was first of all, it felt terrible to even think about that but also um it felt to me that the students deserved better they were they were you know as you say they'd given up a lot to be there uh there was a real sense of of having chosen to be with us so i i think it was just kind of a combination of things it would be a cleaner life if if you know we really gave the students their due and it turns out it left a lot of time for writing you know and the engagement with you know with students too was also really it keep you know as you know it, it keeps you honest you 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 have to stay uh you have to stay in a mode of thinking freshly about literature and and the day that you you know automatically said what you said last year is the day you're going down the tubes at a place like Syracuse so i think it was you know i think your perception of that is right it's just i think all of us even to this day we feel like well you can have both you you can put a, a lot of energy into teaching a lot into uh writing and actually it's sort of a an additive additive thing i think i don't know and there's an interesting moment in the um in the book where you talk about reading um must have been an undergraduate paper and it and it was it was written in a kind of um i think this is in the google chapter it was written in a sort of a um oh um erudite way and, and you found it um kind of fascinating and, and you then you started uh, writing john your your, your story um kind of in that voice um I, yeah. I'm, I'm curious what else yeah it was, it, it was no it was an undergrad story uh, an essay about the metamorphosis a freshman essay and it had the sentence in there um upon up some like upon perusing this literary artifact i felt myself at a distinct tilt you know so it's like it's like that, yeah, that's gold you know and the kid wasn't kidding he that was his that was his you know his deal so um i mean did you what else did what else did teaching i mean what has it done for you for your craft does it because i can imagine it also makes you a little you know i find when i'm a teacher i teach journalism right so i i i teach kind of long form journalism i'm always talking about structure and and you know what the best way to kind of arrange your material is and i do find that when i sit down to write my own long form journalism it does get a get a little in my way where I'm like, what would I tell my students, you know? And and then I'm like, but I don't want to do yeah. that. Uh, and yeah, yeah, yeah. I, mean, I I always have that feeling after a good semester of sitting down and going, oh man, you were wrong, you know, or you were you were about half right, you know. This move you just did, you didn't mention that, you know. So I, but even that I mentioned in class, I'll say, here's my best take on it. Also, I'm a little full of shit, you know. This this thing that we're doing is so. Um, uh, it's so hard and it's so beautiful and it's so, you know, it, it takes so much of, of a person's resources. You are not going to be able to reduce it to a simple formula. But so for me, one thing that happens when I'm done with the semester, there's an incredible relief at not having to articulate it anymore, but just go ahead and do it. So I have a lot of a real creative bursts at the end of semesters where I, I can just get free of the need to explain, you know, or, or reduce. Uh, beyond that, I think that the best thing is that it really does – keep you uh I, I was honest i mean if 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 i have to teach google and i go into a bunch of students like you were in those days you know you and levin and phil marsh and that crew and uh ellen Littman and all you know all those brilliant students um you you really have to think fresh about it every day even if you're 62 you know you, you have to come to it freshly so so that's nice you know it's just a way of of a kind of a gut check because you know in this life it's fairly easy to you know, to sort of start hardening into um, a, a series of poses, you know, or a series of things you've said a million times before. So I think that's the opportunity is to go in front of people who are as in love with this thing as I was at 27 
and are not going to be satisfied with formulas and you know and and cliches and so on um, and they like you even though you're old um so yeah so I, so kind of um a segue into the book from, from that um you know the surprise of the book came came for me in the Turgenev chapter where um you know i kind of thought it was going to be a you know a, a really entertaining book about you know how to how to make a short story and, and kind of plot and, and a lot of things that I learned from you, um, you know, uh, in, in workshop. And then um, it took this turn in the Turgenev chapter where um, you started talking about Turgenev as a sort of odd and, and in a way artless writer who, who nonetheless, um, you know, decided to embrace that aspect of his, of his art. Um, and so there's a, an amazing passage that, that I thought you could read on page 108. Um, um, and maybe you could just kind of set it up a little bit about, about kind of finding your own voice. Yeah, th this would actually, you know, take us back before I had a first book out. And I'd been kind of floundering, trying to be Hemingway and um, writing these kind of very humorless, uh, you know, realist narratives. And I blundered into a funny story that actually was had some life in it. Um, so I say, uh, when I finished that story, which is called The Wavemaker Falters, uh, I could see that it was the best thing I'd ever written. There was some essential me-ness in it, for better or worse, no one else could have written it. The things that were actually on my mind at that time, because they were in my life, were in the story. Class issues, money shortages, work pressures, fear of failure, the oddball tonality of the American workplace, the failures of grace, my state of overwork was causing me to commit every day. The story was oddly made, slightly embarrassing. It exposed my actual taste, which it turned out was kind of working class and raunchy and attention seeking. I held that story up against the stories I loved, some of which are in this book, and felt I'd let the form down. So this moment of supposed triumph, I'd found my voice was also sad. It was as if I sent the hunting dog that was my talent out across a meadow to fetch a magnificent pheasant and it had brought back, let's say, the lower half of a Barbie doll. To put it another way, having gone about as high up Hemingway Mountain as I could go, having realized that even at my best I could only ever hope to be an acolyte up there, resolving never again to commit the sin of being imitative, I stumbled back down into the valley and came upon a little shithill labeled Saunders Mountain. Hmm, I thought, it's so little, and it's a shit hill. Then again, that was my name on it. This is a big moment for any artist, this moment of combined triumph and disappointment, when we have to decide whether to accept a work of art that we have to admit we weren't in control of as we made it, and which we're not entirely sure we approve. It is less, less than we want it to be, and yet it's more, too. It's small and a bit pathetic, judge against the work of the great masters, but there it is, all ours. What we have to do at that point, I think, is go over sheepishly but boldly and stand on our shit hill and hope it will grow. And to belabor this already questionable metaphor, what will make that shit hill grow is our commitment to it, the extent to which we say, well, yes, it is a shit hill, but it's my shit hill. So let me assume that if I continue to work in this mode that is mine, the hill will eventually stop being made of shit and will grow. And from it, I'll eventually be able to see and encompass in my work the whole world. Thank you. Um, and and um, when, so when did that, so had you already done your MFA at Syracuse when that happened? Was that after your? Yes, yes. I, I, I basically, I mean, I, I went through my whole MFA at Syracuse writing uh, Hemingway asked stories about the time that I'd been in Asia that were really kind of DOA and um, kind, of, kind of knew it. You know how sometimes you just know that it's not happening, but you, you can't help it. So then I got out and started, uh, we had our daughter, our first daughter, Caitlin, and uh, started working and we're still cranking out the Hemingway, you know, with some variation. Sometimes I'd do a little Joyce or a little Malcolm Lowry just for variety. Uh, and then, um, uh, yeah, I was working as a tech writer. So yeah, it was, it was actually that, incident I just described probably happened about four or five years after the MFA. 
Yeah. So it was it, it was a long haul, you know, and it was kind of like, and I was I think at that point thirty three or something like that, you know. So. And, and um, did that? Did you? Was that story published? I know it was in Civil War Land. Yeah, it did. It got published in a very in a, a, a small magazine. I can't I'm blanking on the name right now, but yeah, it got published, and I had a big. You know, we got uh, we went out for dinner and spent the check plus some, and um, yeah. But it was. But I sent that story to Toby to, to Vice Wolf, and he wrote back just saying, "Yeah, you're on the right track. This I haven't seen something like this before." You know, so the the victories in, at that time were very small but very rich because I was definitely in the zone where I could see the whole thing just stopping, you know, I just give up. And, 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 you know, we had at that point, two daughters then, and I had a job, a respectable job was actually probably the happiest I'd ever been from the familial thing. So I, 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 I think I, I certainly, you know, that moment when you accept the idea that, Oh, maybe I just was wrong about being a writer. This, you know, so those little victories were very sweet. And they were also what I remember was just the feeling of, you know, working at this engineering job. So it was pretty hard and it was a stretch for me. And then just thinking, okay, let me just do, you know, uh, one paragraph today. Th that would be great. One fresh paragraph would be good. And sometimes you did and sometimes you didn't. And so I, li I like the scale of that life a lot. Um, so I just, I just saw someone in the chat demanding that we uh, talk about the Russians. So, um, <laughs> So be it. <laughs> um, how, how did you start teaching these stories? Uh, well, it was right after this period, and I had gotten an offer. Syracuse had a big blow up in their program. A bunch of people quit. So I got a call. Uh, would you come and teach for uh, a year? And I I came and did the interview. It was There's a lot of angry vibe in the year, and I thought, oh, no way. I'm not doing this. Anyway, I ended up teaching it, and then uh, was told that I teach the workshop, which I felt okay about, and then a, a literature class to these MFA students. And I just thought, oh God, I've you know, I'd never taught grad students, and I didn't, you know, I, I was a geophysics major as an undergrad. So I had just finished War and Peace for the first time, and uh, so I thought I'll just I'll just do a class on the Russians, and that way I can read some of them, you know. So I think half the syllabus was just people I'd heard of and stories I hadn't read. Um, just a convenience, really. And then <clears throat> the class went pretty well, considering the, <laughs> considering the prep I had done for it. And um, then I just got in the habit of, of doing it every year and refining it a little bit. So it was kind of just default, you know. Um, the stories, I, are, they're simple, and they're a little bit old-fashioned. So I think they're, they're nice to teach in that way. They're, they're, um, they're very, uh, yeah, kind of primary. Um, I, mean, I mean, they're almost, it, it is, um, so can you say more about what, what appeals to you about uh, these particular writers? Well, I mean, I, I, you know, I was a very working class person. And uh, in our circle, nobody really read serious fiction. Uh, so I, but I liked to read and I was good at it. And my first understanding of literature was that it was sort of like basically self-help. You know, I read Robert Persig, that Zen in the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance, and was a big Ayn Rand fan because, you know, she told me how to live and uh, Khalil Gibran. So I first understood fiction as just some real sharp advice on how you should think about your life, you know, and like, and like that. Um, so I think the Russians were the first, were the Russians and Steinbeck were the first writers I could kind of understand in that context. Like, okay, The Grapes of Wrath is, you know, pretty much a moral ethical uh, document. Uh, and then I think when I read Crime and Punishment back in college, I, I thought, oh, yeah, this is something. So I think it was just the, the sense that uh, this wasn't, it, it, these stories weren't separate from the questions that were big in my life, you know, that, that kind of thing. Now, I don't know if that's how Russians think about their own literature or not, but I, to me it felt, you know, I was there once in the 80s and uh, went to a, a dinner party with some some Russians I had just met, and it was kind of a a dream, you know, like um, uh, these uh, Russian kids were drinking vodka and they had memorized vast sections of George Bernard Shaw and were reciting it. And so, um, yeah, so I just I just felt an affinity for the for the moral ethical urgency of the stories, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, Which of them chats are quite prescriptive, right? <laughs> Talk about the book. We are talking about the book. 
<laughs> just wait a minute. We'll get to it. And I don't care if I sell it. What do I look like? Some kind of a prostitute? Um, well, I, no, I, all right. I, I mean, uh, the, the the question of, I mean, the, you know, I, I think of you as a moral ethical writer, right? I mean, I think this is kind of, um, I don't know if you think of yourself that way, right? But there's a very strong... Um, Definitely. You do. You yeah, do. and I think, you know, to, sometimes to my detriment. I mean, I think when I look at my basic storytelling impulse, it's very sort of biblical. You know, I was raised Catholic, and a lot of my stories are kind of about, sal you know, being saved or something like that. So, yeah, I've always, and I've just never really been interested or in fiction that isn't that. I can't, I just can't quite get my head around it, so for sure. And what, what I learned, we'll turn to the book a bit here. What I learned from writing this book was that the, the, the moral, it, it expanded my understanding of that question because Chekhov, for example, he, he really isn't trying to tell you anything, but he's trying to create these juxtapositions, often in the structure of the stories, that, that make you up your game in terms of moral ethical considerations. So he, he'll, he'll pose a question answer it persuasively in two different flavors, and then you're left with that. You're left with the, this sort of uh, enforced pattern of ambiguity. And when you come out of the story, you're, at least I'm always reminded of how facile my moral judgments usually are. You know? that's, now, that's a moral ethical function. You know, if you can read something and be reminded that your early projections are facile, that's pretty good. You know? One thing about, I mean, you know, something that keeps coming up in the book is that um, a lot of these guys were, were not in their lives, um, and, and, you know, Tolstoy is kind of the best example, they, but, but to a certain extent, you know, Chekhov seems, seems like a pretty good guy, but, but um, they weren't great people, um, and yet, um, and you kind of wrestle with that. I mean, just talk talk a little bit about you know the the kind of the problem yeah. the writer who writes you know morally and ethically but is himself maybe not such a good person yeah i mean for me as somebody who's not you know that like that great uh, i think the the, the allure of, of writing once i started to really revise is that you can get glimpses of your better nature you know so for example i i tend to be in first drafts uh, sentimental moralistic and a little hyperbolic that's just me uh, that's how i am at parties for example well but now you know from from a lifetime now of, of editing i i can pick up on those valences and edit them out so if you if i eliminate those negative qualities then something else shows up in their in you know in their absence so i think uh you know i i quote Kundera in the book who says that that a writer is writing out of a kind of super super personal wisdom and that if the book is only as smart as the writer himself, the writer should get a different job. So I, I, I think um, all of us, I mean, for me, the, the, the allure of it is to say, by writing and editing conscientiously and trying to keep, you know, to keep improving my aesthetic standard, I actually kind of put a target out in front of myself for how I might actually function in the real world, you know? And if you think of, and in the book, I'm talking about how um, a story is kind of a process of, early projection and then refinement into a higher level of truthfulness. You can see this in the stories in the book. You can see it in, in one's revision process. So if that's the case, one, it's very similar to what the mind does, supposedly, according to neuroscience. It, it functions by making a model and then using sensory input to refine the model. And, and this revision supposedly actually happens from the rear of the head to the front. Um, and then uh, what you, what you, see in, in the process of revision is that the mind is actually a storyteller. The mind is, that's actually why we like it so much. So the idea is by, by being closely in touch with one's editorial tastes and uh, you could actually tease out a, a, a sort of scale model of a better, per, better version of yourself, I guess. Do you, and, and yet there's, um, you know, you describe in the book, the process of revision um, of, of, um, you know, going through a story a thousand times, right? Um, taking out sentences that strike you as, as extraneous, um, you know, changing them around, uh, uh, heightening the efficiency of the story. Um, and yet this is a, 
it's like a, it's a selfish act to sit in there and do that in a room, right? Um, you're kind of not doing yes. it for, for anyone. Um, how do you reconcile those things? Well, I, I think, uh, yeah, but actually the way, uh, he, here's how I see it. When you're, when I'm writing a story, I'm imagining a reader who is my equal. So although the, the act itself is selfish, the, the imaginative process is very friendly and egalitarian because what I'm saying is I, I'm going to revise this thing until someone who's as smart and, you know, worldly and curious as me would be compelled to finish it. So in that sense, it's, it's a, uh, I think, a, a generous um, act. And it, it also, you know, theoretically trains us in the question of how, how do we imagine the other? How, when I'm sitting down on a, with my, my blank screen and I'm imagining a reader on the other side, what do I think of her? Uh, and actually, the way you tell her what you think of her is by the quality of your revisions, you know? If you say, you know, like, like uh, the cat crossed the black table, the ebony expanse, the dark-hued flatness. Well, by that third incarnation, as a reader, I'm feeling a little bit insulted because I feel like the writer is just doing a sort of masturbatory dance. So to cut those second two, you know, even at that small level, it says something about one's relation to a reader. And if the entire book is imbued with that kind of respect, then I think it comes out of selfishness into a kind of a, you know, a, a generosity. And so if among these writers, um, you know, we have uh, Tolstoy, Chekhov, Turgenev, Gogol. Um, is there one more? That's it. I think that's it. No, um, that's it. Four. Who's, who's, uh, who's the closest uh, to, 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 to you? I mean, who do you, who do you like the best? <laughs> yeah, I, you know, to me, it's, that's a little bit, it's funny because I like, uh, I think of it a little bit like that Peanuts comic strip, like do you like Linus or Charlie Brown or Lucy better? It's like, well, they're all kind of, they have corollaries in me. That, for me, Tolstoy is, that Master and Man, I think is, is the most amazing story in the book. Uh, I feel a kind of brotherly, I'd like to be like Chekhov. I feel like he's, you know, the, the nicest and kind of the most, um, he'd be the most comfortable at any party, you know, and, and he would give you the best advice. Uh, but actually, on, a, on an aesthetic level, Gogol is, is the person who mystifies me. I don't really think he's that funny. And he, in English translation, he's medium funny. I never am moved to tears. But whenever I think about writing a book, a big book, I think about Dead Souls, you know, and the way that his, his um, he seems to, his view of people seems to most fully account for, let's say, the 20th century, you know. Like, I, I can't really put the Nazis and Chekhov in the same thought balloon but Gogol I, I think he he has um, a very acute understanding of the way that we delude ourselves and the way that comedy comes out of excessive self-belief and so Gogol Gogol is the person I'm kind of on the trail of in my own aesthetic you know in my mind aesthetically I'm trying to figure out what would an American dead soul sound like you know um, is there an American writer that I mean are, do, do, do you think of American writers that have corollaries with with um, I mean, Gogol is a, is like Mark Twain is a bit of, but go on, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think of Confederacy of Dunces, but how about, I mean, I, I wanted to ask you this. What does, in, in Russian, who does Gogol most sound like of, of writers in English, if, the, if that's even a fair question? I mean, I, get, I mean, Twain, right? I mean, it's, it's, it's right? I think Mark Twain mm -hmm. is, 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 is kind of, um, but, uh, but a little uh, darker. Right, a little scarier. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, and as I, you know, and this is, I don't speak Russian, so one of the things I, I, I heard is that there's so many cool sound things that Gogol does that don't just don't translate into English, and you kind of just have to, you just lose them. Is, is that true? Um, yeah, I mean, he, you know, some of his stuff is actually, I, uh, my Russian is, I mean, it's, it's like half Ukrainian. Um, it's actually hard for me to, to, mm -hmm. to read. Um, but yeah, I mean, I was I was interested in your. Uh, were you worried about? Um, I mean, I really I really admired. You know, you just kind of um, chose the translations that that you thought, you know, that you were kind of that you liked the best that you had re read the most often. Yeah, uh, you do do some um, kind of comparison of translations here and there. But what was your, what was your thinking in terms of um, the use of the translations? 
Yeah. I mean, my thought was that this is never, the class was never, a, you know, really a class in the Russians. It was a class in short story craft. We're just going to use these seven cadavers to, to learn what we can. So in that sense, it, it actually literally doesn't matter um, if the translations are good even, you know, I, I think these are all pretty good, but I, it, it really didn't matter. I, I always say, you know, let's pretend we found this story in English on a bus. Uh, you know, master and man in English on the bus is pretty damn good, so we can use it. Uh, and then what, what I would do in class is if we got to a place where the meaning was unclear, you know, where, uh, or where there was some difference of opinion about what this section meant, then we'd bring in other translations just to try to triangulate on them a little bit. But, you know, you, this book could, you could write a book like this using American stories or using stories in English. It doesn't, it almost doesn't matter what the found object is. It's the, the process of looking at it um, analytically that, that I was really offering. Um, it is nice that 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 there's so much. Um, I mean, uh, uh, you know, th three of them knew each other, right? I mean, you know, sort of. You have that um, lovely passage at the end about uh, sort of Chekhov's encounter with, with Tolstoy. Um, Tolstoy, I, I remember, I think he hated Turgenev. Um, and there's something nice about the fact that they all sort of intersected and had opinions about one another, right? It it, it makes it a, into a kind of enclosed world, yeah. a little bit, right? And, and and you use the triad. And there's a story that I'm sorry. There is a, there is a story that I left out that Turgenev came to the Tolstoy's house, and he showed them how they were dancing in Paris. He did some kind of a dance, and Tolstoy was not amused. He you know he thought it was just like oh Turgenev. He's, the, his, Tolstoy's kids loved it, and it seemed like a really nice moment for Turgenev. But but Leo wasn't into it. Um, in general, I was there, there, throughout the throughout the book. There are these. Um, I don't know that they ever met, actually, or maybe it's Dostoevsky. I, I can't remember. But but um, there's there's a lot of kind of um, apocryphal stuff where there's a um, Einstein quote that uh, um, one of your students miss uh, you yeah. know miss uh, uh, represented to you, and then there's a uh, Robert Frost quote that was not quite right, but they're kind of better than. Uh, yeah. um, I actually recently re uh, discovered by accident um, there's like a famous Irving Howe essay. Um, and it, it goes off, um, I think you, you must've, uh, I, I, I think you referenced it's Gorky, there's this um, uh, Gorky um, diary about spending um, summer with, with Tolstoy in, in the Crimea, do you remember this? And there's mm -hmm. uh, a lot of cool Tol Tolstoy on a, in there. And, and at one point, um, yeah. uh, uh, Tolstoy gives Gorky his diary and, um, just he's like here, read my. He was always giving people his diary, right? Um, and <laughs> yeah. as a kind of forced, like a forced intimacy, right? Um, here, you know, and yeah, yeah, um, yeah. And there's a there was a fragment in it that that where where Tolstoy had written, um, "God is my desire," mm -hmm. um, and it was. I, I think it meant in Russian. It, it seems to to suggest that the it's a it's not a complete sentence, like God is my desire to do something or my, my God is my desire for mm -hmm. something, but he didn't finish. So it just says, God is my desire. And uh, Gorky says, you know, Tolstoy, uh -huh. what does it mean? And Tolstoy says, well, that's, I, I don't know, you figure it out or, you know, something like that. Um, mm -hmm. And, but there's a famous essay by Irving Howe um, uh, about socialism where he like misremembers that quote. And um, as God mm -hmm. is the name of my desire, and um, how changes it to socialism is the name of my desire. I don't know. So I I, I feel like that's um in your in your writing too that this is a kind of uh, 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 a sort of um, interest in found um, language or you know like kind of stuff that's a little bit off but has meaning. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, this is one of the things that I loved about teaching all these years is that stuff. You know, I never was like. Uh, I was always, I felt like I was always teaching sort of out of half of my brain. I was, you know, I was writing, having a family, teaching, and these things accrete, you know, these, these, like these, uh, this Einstein quote, you know, uh, it just, it was almost like a, a little thing that rolled downhill. And pretty soon I'm saying, as Einstein said, and then I went to look it up and it doesn't exist. And the, the nearest thing to it is nothing like it. So uh, there's something lovely about being part of this revolving door of young writers you know and every fall you go in and sort of stumble in there and they stumble in and you have these moments and then after 20 years of it something has accreted you know that's why I wanted to write the book because whether or not it's a value or it's um 
you know, defensible as scholarship, that accretion is really interesting. And to have the opportunity to have, you know, by now hundreds of young writers like you were, uh, it, it's really lovely, you know. It's, and I think there's wisdom in it. You know, that, that Einstein quote that I made up, that my student made up, is much better than his original <laughs> and is really useful, you know. <laughs> um, well, I mean, to, to get back to the question of teaching and, and the book, like, you know, one of the... <laughs> I mean, the essential lesson of the book seems to me to, to be, um, you know, you have to be yourself, right? You have to like discover your, mm. um, you know, your ear for, for language and, and, and your process of revision, right? And the way that you want senses to be. Um, can you teach that? And, and how? No, no. And you don't, I don't think you have to. And what we do at Syracuse, you know, we get uh, six or 700 applications for six spots. So that... The mechanics are have been figured out years ago. They're already original. They've been the best writer in their groups forever. So I think what you what you're trying to do is, it, at this point, I'm a better teacher than I was years ago. But at this point, I'm trying to get the student to admit to the obstruction that he or she is experiencing, even if she can't name it. You don't have to name it, but just sort of sidle up to it, and then uh, I want to hear about that in her words. I want to witness it on the page, and I want to do some edits. You know, uh, it's better if the thing doesn't isn't named even. You know, but uh, sometimes it's it's leading a, a a person to the material that she doesn't want to touch. It's too dangerous. Sometimes it's uh, taking somebody who's got a natural gift for this kind of writing but doesn't trust it, making them trust it. So, um, and then I think that the the biggest thing I'm teaching these days. It has to do with the short story form itself, which is very rigid, actually. It's like a, in, in the book, I say it's like a joke. You know, a short story has some leeway, but not that much. There are kind of physics that, op that are operative, you know, like escalation is expected. Specificity is rewarded. You know, um, precision is good. Everything to purpose is the, is the, the desire. So in some ways, it's talking to students about that stuff, which is really fairly technical and simple, but you, you ignore it at your own peril. You know, it's like, like song structure. Y you can be as, as crazy as you want, but, but Hendrix played within song structure. You know, that's why he, that's why you could sense the craziness, you know, cause he was pushing against structure. So that's something that in the book, um, I was trying to tease out without being too reductive is just to say, okay, given that we've accepted that we're going to try to write a short story, what are the laws not the rules, but the sort of laws of physics that, that pertain. And it, these were really interesting stories because they just totally, uh, they're, they're great examples of all these things, you know, uh, of escalation and specificity and so on. So that was, that's what I, I talk to my students a lot about. And at this age, at this advanced age, I have the confidence to kind of say, no, really, cause and effect, you have to, you know. Uh, and um, yeah, so, or or escalation, yeah, you really do have to. There's, you know. <laughs> you, you say, and-, and um, Or, you, you, you <laughs> not, not that you have to, but you have to be aware of the, the formal expectation of those things. Then if you want to write Waiting for Godot, you can, but you're still in conversation with escalation. You, know? um, you, you say in the book that the, the, and I forget the second one, you know, the two things that distinguish the students um, because not everybody goes on, you know, um, not everybody goes on to publish, right? And some people decide they don't want to do it. Like right. they, they get out of the program and they're like, you know, that wasn't for me. Yeah. Um, uh, you, you say uh, a, a kind of understanding of causality. And actually, I, I have forgotten the second one, <laughs> which may be my problem. But uh, the re, re, no, the re, revision. <laughs> yeah. Re, yeah. I said, you know, again, I'll, I, I, in no way did I want to write a you must book or a book of, of rules. But it, did, it does occur to me that when you really get down to it, the people who've gone on to publish, they have gotten into a serious conversation with their own revision process. That's one. Uh, the second thing is that they have said, yeah, um, causality is kind of the, the magic moment. So, you know, I always say that any of us who are good writers can sort of put water in a pot and get it on the stove. And that's like in a story, that's exposition. You know, it's a, a three page, beautiful description of your childhood home or something. That's great. Um, but as a teacher, you know, I've read whole novels of that. And what we're really waiting is for is the water to boil for the, you know, for things to escalate or change or at least threaten to. 
And it seems to me that that's the place that people get stuck on. And you can't teach that, actually. I, I can't. You know, you can identify it when it starts to happen. That's useful. You can identify its absence, which is hurtful and useful. Um, and you can sort of put this conversation in play and say, yeah, you, this is stasis. What we want is for things. And, you know, mechanically, I sometimes say to people who write the 500-page book and exposition, just put this sentence in there on page 8. Then one day something happened that changed everything forever. Th and that's where, you know, the, esca the escalate. So, so I think those two things, if you revise and if you sort of admit that causality is your goal somehow, those are the people who seem to be able to, to, to publish. Um, great. Should we, should we take some questions from this unruly crowd? Sure. Sure. Let's do it. All right. There are, of course, way too many questions for us to get to, so I apologize in advance to everyone. But there's certainly quite a few. And Keith, if you want to take a look at the questions in the Q&A, um, I'm going to start us off going back to the Russians. Here's a question from a viewer. Do the Russians have a leg up on the moral, ethical, somewhat tragic human experience versus the great Western authors, Hemingway, Faulkner? Um, are the Americans too um, solistic? Is their redemption Russian literature? Yes. <laughs> no, I, 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 I mean, my instinct is that for, for me, the, I'll, I'll tell you, I try to teach a class like this based on American lit, and it didn't go as well. I, now, that could just be that the American stories didn't, you know, jibe with my aesthetic understanding. But um, I, think, I think American stories, for me, tend to be more about, uh, it's hard to generalize, but, you know, that Hemingway asks sort of, I'm an outlier. I'm, I'm an exceptional person in, in my time. Uh, it's my, my, my battle to stay independent of my culture. Whereas with the Russians, I kind of feel, at least in this period, that they're, they're uh, a little comfortable being part of a community and a culture. And, and so somehow that interests me more. But I, again, it's, hard to, it's really hard to generalize. I think. Keith, do you have a thought on that? I, do, I, I, I don't. Um, I can read, a, I have a question that I, I'd like to read from the Q&A. Um, it's from uh, San, Sandhya. Sorry, sorry about that, Sandhya, uh, uh, about mangling your name. Sometimes I stay awake at night thinking I need an MFA or some sort of validation to write. I'm not sure if it's the fear of missing out or the fear that I know next to nothing about how to write a novel. Reading other novels' stories convinces me that I should never write, as I could never write that way, and I have no idea about form, structure, or plot. So while stories swim in my head, they are stubborn and refuse to manifest on paper thanks to the, this arresting fear. How do I get out of this sort of writer's block? Mm. Do well-established writers feel this too? Hey, yes, I think everyone has that feeling. And I mean, I, I, I'll give you an answer that might be a facile answer, but I think the answer is revision. Because any, to me, and I, you know, and everyone, I'm, I'm certainly subject to all those things you listed. But it seems to me if you get in the habit of saying, I'm gonna type something, I'm gonna do my best, but I know that I can alter it, and I know that I can, as I alter it by applying my taste, that's writing too, you know. So the idea that you don't have to be wedded to the first thing you write, then it frees you up to be what all of us are anyway, which is a pretty good line-to-line -line judgmental reader, you know. So to me, that I when I was younger, I had all these this angst about which lineage that which lineage that I want to belong to what kind of novels that I want to write, what was my philosophy, and those things will just stop you dead. Yeah, I don't think you can decide those things before, but you can decide them at speed just by taking a paragraph, even if it's really crummy, and then trying to improve it uh, into something better. You know, At least that's something that you can kind of do that's workable. Um, so yeah, so, so I, I think that's the truth. You know, it's, For me anyway, as a pretty neurotic person, uh, getting in relation to re revision answered a lot of questions. There's so many questions that you actually can't answer in advance of working on a piece. So you don't have to. You know, you can just uh, apply what I call in the book your micro decision maker, you know, to a line at a time and, and see, see where it goes. I don't know. Does that make sense? Keith, do you have an answer for that as a novelist? Oh, um, yeah. I mean, I, I remember uh, 
um, when I was when I was uh, in the middle of writing a terrible country, um, I I went to dinner with a friend of mine who's who's a, a novelist who's written you know six or seven novels. He's he's an accomplished novelist, and and I said, oh well, you know, I'm I'm so miserable. I'm having such a terrible time writing this book. Um, you must not feel that way. You've kind of figured it out, right? Um, mm -hmm. and, and you know, I, I man, I, I wish I was there. And he said, and he said, no, it is always hell. <laughs> Being in the middle of a novel is always hell. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And I, you know, I found that very hard yeah. and, and depressing at the same. <laughs> yeah, and I think what ha what can happen is you get a little more like, oh yeah, this is hell again. Okay, I, you know, it's not, it's. It's hack because you've been there before, maybe, you know, or something like that. But. Um, so Michael Dawson asks, um, I'd like to hear George talk about what happens to his obsessive fixing method when he works in longer form um, in Bardo, for instance, as opposed to short stories. Is writing a book uh, just a large hunk sure. of that, or does he try to view it as a, a bag of short story ish units? That's a nice way of putting it. Yeah. That, I, I mean, I only have that one novel which may or may not be a novel but my experience there was that it was the same same ideas but i gave myself the gift of a real simple structure at the beginning so i just you know before i ever started i'd been thinking about it for many years and i thought okay lincoln goes to the graveyard uh he interacts with his son's body and at some point i don't know when he leaves and i don't know why that's one strand the other one was willie's spirit is there probably shouldn't be and either leaves or doesn't. That was before I ever started. That was kind of the framework. So that was really helpful because the, you know if that was sort of the clothesline in which I was going to hang the sections, and then this sort of spontaneous approach that I describe in the book could be applied to the individual uh, units. So it was sort of like I, I would say it's like I'd been building yurts my whole life and stories. This was just like a series of yurts connected to make a bigger a bigger house. So I think that's probably. I mean, if I was going to write another novel, I would want to have the the um, the security of a kind of overstructure like that, and know that the improvisation was going to happen within that larger that larger structure. But great. Um, Erica Lansdowne asks, if you don't have a teacher as sublime as George Saunders, how do you figure out what are your obstructions? Yeah, uh, I, I, th I mean, honestly, I think part of it is, is uh, okay, I, in the book I mentioned this idea. It's kind of a, a silly idea, but it's close to true that when I'm rereading my stuff to revise it, I imagine there's this little meter in my head, and this is positive and this is negative. So the, it's almost like a meditative thing where what you're trying to do is read it as you would read it, and with part of your mind, you're stepping out and watching yourself read and you're trying to really be honest about what that reader thinks. You know, is she in the book all the way? And then at some point she gets kicked out on page eight. At that point, I think if you're not trying too hard to conceptualize about it or or be reductive about it, there's often a little tiny voice that knows. You know, and it's not it's not for me anyway. It's not complicated. It's like this is boring. This is pretentious. Or, you know, it doesn't even go that far. It's just a feeling like, eh, no, I don't. Or the, or the best one is when, when I think to myself, nobody is going to believe this anymore. That you've just broken that fictive dream that John Gardner talks about. Then, if you can just go, yeah, 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 okay. And then sometimes a fix is given to you instantly. You know, so all this happens in a split second before the, there's any conceptualizing about it. That's, so the obstructions are always there. You know, um, The other thing that I've noticed in the last couple of years of teaching is that what a lot of writers do, you know, in the workshop model, the inclination is to say, this is good, this is bad, cut this, retain this, which I, I find really hard to work with. But I've been thinking about this idea of the avoidance moment, which is related to obstruction. So let's say that we imagine that, you know, a, a story by you takes 40 drafts to get to where it wants to be. Let's just say that's the number. Well, at every step along the way, there are decisions that you're not ready to make yet. Your subconscious isn't ready to decide what happens on page six. It, it knows something happens, but it, it's not sure. So what it often will do is put in some shitty prose there, a, a grandiose idea expressed badly, or a flashback, or a spaceship lands, or something like that. So what we've been doing in workshop is kind of saying, let's just bracket those off. And if the writing goes off, we don't have to say it's bad writing. We just have to say it's an avoidance. There's something going on there that's percolating. The subconscious doesn't want to 
do it yet. And often those are turn out to be the most important moments of the story, and your subconscious is protecting you by saying, please don't try this yet because the rest of the story hasn't come into focus and you'll, and you'll mess it up. So obstruction doesn't necessarily, in my view, doesn't mean a big psychological thing. It just means the stuff that bugs you about your own work. And sometimes to just say, yeah, that bothers me. I suck at endings, you know, or um, I always get off track halfway through the story. I think sometimes, you know, in, in art, just the admission of something is um, – the clue to the brain to start to start working on it you know i don't know hmm. um a few of these questions i guess could be boiled down to how do you how do you know when you have found your individual style or voice well i don't know i mean i think uh, one one thing i notice is you're um when I made that transition, there was the, the symptom that I noticed was that I always had a strong opinion about the piece in progress. B before that, when I was in Hemingway mode, I just would be like, I don't know. And I would actually sometimes read other Hemingway stories and try to model mine on that. So the payoff would come at about the same place and all that. I, um, when I started writing in this new mode, I just knew. It was like if you were at a party and you're trying to be funny, you kind of know how to do that. It's not You don't have to go look at a textbook, you know. So I think that's one symptom that you're getting closer to your own thing is, is when the decisions you're making, you, you feel like you have what you need to make the decision. Whereas in that other mode, you're sometimes like, I don't know. And then and what happens then is you start conceptualizing and, and you know, well, since this is about patriarchy, I should name the character, you know, whatever. Um, but in I think when we're in our own zone, it's a little more like uh, – you know, when you're eating food, you know whether you like it or not. It's not a, you don't have to be theoretical about it. And I think once, you, when you get into a mode that's more your own, the decisions are, are at least makeable. It, they're not always easy. And they often, in, in my case, involve a lot of rewriting and working around, but I'm not unsure of what I'm trying to do. You know, I'm, I'm pretty sure of that. Um, a lot of the questions uh, basically say, um, thank you for writing this book. Um, I second that. Uh, are you going to do another book like Thank this? Thank you for reading it. Are you going to do another uh, workshop? I think probably not. I think, yeah. No, I don't, I don't think so. I mean, I like, I, I, you know, the funny thing about this book is the, the mails I'm getting at my Syracuse account, which is open, are so lovely. You know, so many people who uh, want to offer an interpretation or are grateful to be reading the Russians. And that was different than, you know, the reception of a, a novel or something. So that was really sweet. But I think I, I'm kind of restless, and I, I I'd like to, uh, yeah, I'd like to probably not, probably not do it again. Although I'm, you know, I'm reading Dubliners again, and uh, I would. I, there's a couple of those I'd love to write essays about. That have you read that recently, Keith? That not recently, no. Yeah, that's good. That's good stuff. Oh my God, it's so much better than it was when I was 25. It's, <laughs> it's... Um, I mean, yeah, yeah, I think I was think I was as I was reading it, I was like, somebody will someday have to write a book about how George managed to write a book about these stories and, and still make it like a, a highly technical book and yet um, extremely readable, um, you know, very personal, um, a, you know, work of art um, on its own, which, which is um, kind of amazing. I, I guess my, so I'm, I'm gonna give myself the last question. Uh, you know, these, these, this question of kind of moral, you know, being a moral person um, or being a moral writer, um, the question of, you know, do you become more empathetic uh, when you read, right? Um, you know, we, we know, <laughs> we just know from the evidence of history, like these, these writers uh, weren't very good write people. Um, you know, the, the, the readers in their uh, stories tend to be not very good people, right? There seems to, you know, um, the non-readers are, are typically better people than the readers. Um, <laughs> you know, I, I don't know. And and obviously we've, uh, we're at a, a pretty lousy play, a moment in our um, national history over here in America. Um, yeah. And, you know, and, and I, I, yeah. I think where I keep, now, where, where I come out on that is, is you know, and in interviews, I sometimes end up proselytizing for fiction. I don't know why exactly. I don't, you know, there's no need. 
Um, but in the book, what I came out is, look, we all know what happens when we read because we all read. So if, you, if we think about the best book we ever read, where were you when you started, where were you when you finished, that's it, you know. Uh, for me, it definitely lights me up and makes me more alert for some time afterwards. And it also, it gives me archetypes. Uh, and I think, you know, again, back to neurosciences, they say now that the, the takeaway from a, a story is located s or is similar to the, the takeaway from actual memory. They're, they're, they're in a familial relationship in your brain. So if you, something has happened to you and you've read about something, they're fairly similar uh, in, in, in your mind. So to me, that's, it's, there are certain fictional tropes that I do keep in my sort of moral calculus, you know, like Scrooge, for example, is a, is a big one. Uh, a lot of Toby Wolf stories are just, I just, when I'm evaluating the world, I'm, I have his characters in my mind. Uh, but I think each of us can, can look at, a, at stories and see what they have done to or for us. For me, it seems to be a bit of a finger in the dike thing. You know, the world is always fucking with us. I mean, there's never been a time in human history when we figured it out. Uh, I suspect that fiction and storytelling and whatever it produces is just a mitigating thing, you know, against horror. And it doesn't always work. The dike doesn't always hold. Uh, but for me personally, I don't really, I mean, I do it more than I want to, but I don't really feel the need to proselytize for it because I, lo I love it. I love reading and I love writing. Uh, I, I don't think I could be argued off it even if somebody proved to me it was slightly deleterious. <laughs> you know, I think I'd still do it. So. Um, great. Well, we are, um, we are out of time. But um, thank you, George. Yes, thank you. Um, thank you Pete, so much. I really appreciate it. Thank you both. And thank you to everyone for joining us uh, for <clears throat> Uh, tonight's program. Um, thank you to our literary committee for making this possible. Again, um, my sincere gratitude to both George and Keith for taking the time and for a wonderful conversation that I think everybody enjoyed. And please um, enjoy the rest of your evening. Be safe and come see us soon at the National Arts Club. Thank you so much. Have a thank good night. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Keith. Thank you.